Welcome back to FranchiseOrders.com. It is uh, day number 45 on the FranchiseOrders.com summer tour. Uh, we are all very well rested. We had a chance to sleep uh, over at my uh, childhood house in Chicago for about five days and uh, had a nice little visit here uh, in Minnesota. Uh, we're finishing off our uh, little journey uh, in Minnesota with uh, some gentlemen who uh, I know quite well. Really excited to have you guys on here. Uh, we have the president of franchising of Winmark slash Winmark Franchise Partners, Steve Murphy. And we also have the vice president of corporate development of Winmark and Winmark Franchise Partners, Al Majerico, with us. Uh, really appreciate you guys hopping on. Yeah, to be thank here. you. Uh, I, this office has been remodeled last time, since last time I was here, like about 10 months ago. So it uh, looks really great, really loving the space, and I appreciate you guys uh, letting, us, uh, letting us hang out here for a little bit. Yeah, great. thank you. So well, let's dive in a little bit. There's a, a bunch of questions that I'm sure that people are itching to know. I think that this is especially interesting for you guys because you guys have a really uh, cool role within Winmark. You guys started your own your own uh, consulting agency really within uh, Winmark for emerging brands. I think this will be a really awesome uh, way for you guys to kind of talk about that in addition to you know all the good things that you guys obviously know. Uh, so to start, guys, uh, I'm sure a lot of people are always wondering, you know, where they should really start to build out uh, in terms of a team when they actually get started with their brand. Uh, what would you guys recommend that people um, that people start with when in terms of which department they should really build out first? Uh, well, I think the one thing that we see is, you know, typically it's usually more than the founder that's kind of started it. So there's usually a team in place, but mm -hmm. everyone's wearing a lot of different hats. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the area that we tend to see the most where they lack the resources and mm -hmm. the knowledge is finance. Mm -hmm. uh, franchise sales, a lot of people will say, that's something that you can add, but usually it's a team effort on the franchise sales department, mm -hmm. and that's one of the more expensive ads you're gonna have. So that, we always believe, can come shortly down the road once you begin to get those initial sales in, mm -hmm. but they usually lack that finance person, and if they don't know where their money's going and they don't know what's going on inside their balance sheet and P&L, uh, they can get in, into some trouble. So we, we usually recommend getting a finance person involved. Hmm. Yeah. Anything well, we Yeah, one of the other things that I would say, in addition to the finance area, is that franchise consultant role. That's going to be down a little bit um, from where they're at. So the founder, as, as Steve mentioned, is going to be critical um, in doing a number of different jobs. But having that training and support from the franchise um, consultant uh, franchise operations person is mm -hmm. going to be critical as they start adding franchisees into the mix. Yeah, not I mean certainly not the not the two sexiest things to do, but I think that they are incredibly important to have in place. And I think that you know if you don't ha if you don't understand the numbers that you're seeing running through the system, and if you don't understand how to actually make the system perform correctly, I think right. that that's two really important aspects. So awesome. So um, in addition to that, guys, um, I'm sure you guys have seen a lot, uh, and when it comes to those first group of franchisees. Uh, over the years, and you know, Steve, you being at Winmark for a long time, and Alan before your time here being at Buffalo Wild Wings, um, you know, I'm sure you guys have seen a lot when it comes to that first group. Uh, in addition, with their, your emerging brands, you guys work with um, anything that you've seen that you know any pitfalls you've seen people run into that maybe people can avoid just based off of what you guys have seen at all. Yeah, I, I think the f the biggest thing to avoid is being desperate. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think, unfortunately, you know, I think the statistics are 3,800 or so active franchisors in the U.S., 75% per the latest data from Frandata being under 50 units. So three out of four franchisors out there are really considered emerging. And, you know, more than likely, if you have less than 50 units, not really making money yet, not being royalty self-sufficient. Mm -hmm. So desperation is a daily activity for them. So not taking that check from that person that you know is not gonna be a good fit. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's too easy for them to say yes and to think about, well, we'll just worry about this later because we gotta pay we gotta pay our payroll next week. And what happens is that those first 10 or 15 that they bring in that really weren't good fits in the first place end up being the ones that hurt them the most as they try to get to 50 to 60 to 70 units. Those are the guys that are underperforming. They're the ones that are poor validation. So they don't realize how critical those mistakes can be in the early days saying just yes to anyone with a check and a pulse coming in the door. Sure. Alan? Yeah, and I think that uh, franchisee validation that's going to be needed uh, from the franchisor level, when you bring in these individuals who are um, maybe not right for the system, that's going to hurt your franchise sales in the future. So making sure that you don't, um, you, you thoroughly vet 
these franchisees that are coming in from a franchisor perspective, not taking the ones that um, are kind of iffy along the way, because you're going to know, you're going to, um, as you do your due diligence with your discovery day, and you have different departments interviewing these individuals to make sure that you award the franchise to the right individuals, you're going to get a great perspective on whether or not a potential franchisee is right for the system. Sure, yeah. absolutely. And I think one, one more thing to add to that too, the other problem we see is sometimes early success, um, onboarding too many at once. Most of these emerging brands are not set up infrastructure or structurally, system, you know, systemically to onboard 20 or 30 or 40 new franchisees in a year. Uh -huh. um, sometimes when they come out, if they're going through the broker networks or they've got outsourced franchise development, if they are very successful, that can turn around to hurt them too because they're not prepared to open up 30 units successfully. They open up maybe five or 10 successfully and the others aren't getting the right onboarding, they don't have the right grand opening, the unit doesn't start off strong. So just being sure that you're measured in your approach as to once you're selling that franchise agreement, how are you gonna open them successfully and making sure you've got that schedule and the support behind it together. Absolutely, right. really awesome advice guys, thank you. So uh, another thing that I think a lot of people probably consistently ask you guys is, you know, their franchising is a very crowded space. It's changed a lot. There are a lot more brands that are out there than there were, you know, even five years ago. Um, so when it comes to actually setting yourself apart from a very crowded market, both on the franchise development side and on the consumer side, it is quite tough to do, right? So is there any strategies that you guys have seen that have really worked for brands uh, on both the franchise development and the consumer side that, you know, you guys wouldn't mind talking about for a bit? Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, I think that differentiation is one of the first things we talk about with every mm -hmm. emerging brand. Uh, unfortunately, today, as you said, there's not enough of it. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of people jumping into franchising that are, we call them the me too concepts. Mm -hmm. There's somebody out there doing a fast casual pizza concept and eight more follow along with it. Um, they consider differentiation, our products better, our services better. Uh, I don't think that's differentiation that's sticky. I don't think it lasts. So I think true differentiation to us is more systemic. It's either you're in a space or a segment that you've started and you're the first one in and it's really unique and you've got a unique product or offering behind it, uh, or you've built and utilized technology and leveraged that or utilize and leverage systems that you have that are proprietary to you. Mm -hmm. um, you know, here at Winmark, we have our own point of sale system that uh, helps the franchisee with what they price the goods for as the customer selling yeah. it to them and what they're going to retail it at. That's a system that's been around with us for 30 years that's completely proprietary to us. That to me is differentiation. Nobody else can come into our space and do what we do without having to build something similar to that, which took us 30 years of refinement to get to where it is today. Sure. Absolutely. Alan, anything from you there? Yeah, I think, you know, differentiation is, is probably the number one. The other thing I would say is uh, strong unit level economics. So mm -hmm. making sure that you're starting out properly and making sure that your foundation is strong, um, not only from a differentiating standpoint, from but from a unit level economic standpoint, from a design standpoint, from a support standpoint, making sure that that foundation is strong as you continue to move forward, because that's going to help you in the future as you start moving forward um, with growing your uh, franchise. Absolutely. Great. Well, awesome, guys. Thank you. So diving into union economics, because that really is the next uh, subject here. Um, I'm sure you guys see brands measure things in a lot of different ways. Is there really any metrics that you guys think are 100% must-haves when it comes to you know measuring how successful a brand is, even when you guys are potentially thinking to take on a client? I'm sure you look at them. Yeah. So is there anything that you guys recommend people ensure that they put in there? Well, I think one of the first things we look at is, is really uh, – what's the return to the franchisee? Because at the end of the day, that, that's all that really matters. So when we look at unit level economics, not only does that mean solid average unit volumes, solid profit margins, uh, it also has to equate to what was the initial investment? What was that item seven? Um, we want to see a 30% cash on cash return on that item seven investment uh, in the first so three to four years, they get that payback at a pre-tax level. Mm -hmm. That's kind of how we gauge whether or not a, a franchise is really uh, in the sweet spot of franchising where you're going to attract the right kinds of investors. If you're not providing that kind of return, most people are going to 
look for something else. Mm -hmm. You know, they want to get in three to four years, they want to get their money back out of it, especially when you look at the risk reward on that stuff. So if you're only providing a 10% or 15% return, it's going to take them 10 years to get their money back. You're not going to be very attractive to today's uh, investor. Awesome. Yep. And one of the things that I would say for the emerging franchisors um, that are just starting out uh, is when you're looking at your corporate locations, if you only have corporate locations and you're looking at um, franchising in the future, make sure that you take out your potential royalties, ad fund fees, technology fees from your corporate locations to get that true bottom line to figure out what that return on initial investment would be. Because a lot of times people don't, the, the fran uh, potential franchisors don't think about some of those things that the franchisee expenses are going to have to be taken into account as they start looking at their P&Ls. Awesome. Well, great advice once again, guys. Thank you. So uh, pivoting to franchise sales, uh, I know that you guys uh, certainly do know uh, quite a bit about that. Um, so would love to kind of dive into any, any recommendations that you guys have in terms of, you know, where you think it's most beneficial for people to receive leads, if there's really any silver bullet for that. And in addition to that, if there's any, any tools that you guys have seen or anything that you must have in your process in order to be successful. Yeah, I think uh, that's, that's a $64,000 question today, right? There's roughly 20,000 transactions a year, and there's 4,000 of us fighting for those 20,000 transactions. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, we, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, most of our leads are coming in as customers of our stores. Mm -hmm. So we've got 1,250 locations out there, so we get quite a few leads every month. Uh, but we do a lot in PR uh, mm -hmm. with Fishman. Uh, that's a tremendous source for us for leads. We do a lot in the digital and social space as well. Uh, so those are typically where we're going to generate our leads from on a Fran Dev side of things. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of other people that you know use broker networks and portals and things like that. We dabble in some of that stuff. We've just found for us that most of our leads are going to come in that are going to be almost self-generated via our stores and, and digital and social. Uh, I think one of the most important things to us is really more on the capitalization side. Mm -hmm. uh, as we have candidates come in, finding qualified candidates that fit not only our operational profile, but our financial profile. And uh, we utilize FranFund for that as one of our partners. So mm -hmm. uh, our candidates can come in and get a basically a free uh, shot at looking at where they stand in terms of getting funded uh, through FranFund. They connect with them and they'll let them know I think it's within 97, 98% uh, degree as to whether or not that they, they can get properly funded via a bank. That gives our candidates that might be on the bubble the assurance that they can get the right fin financing. And uh, for us as a franchisor, it allows us to work with people that maybe we would have said no to if we know we can put them through this partnership and have them come out the other end and you know with some approval on funding. Awesome. Thanks, Dave. Yeah, in addition to in addition to PR, I'd say some of the digital things um, are increasingly important. Um, digital seems to be taking over kind of the media space right now. Sure. Um, in terms of just the way that you can target, um, the way that you can, uh, it's less costly to mm -hmm. find more of a targeted lead mm -hmm. um, through that. And then making sure that you have that follow-up system. There's a lot of great op, uh, great suppliers out there that are doing text messaging. Mm -hmm. um, you know a couple of them. I certainly do. <laughs> <laughs> um, and making sure that you follow up immediately with those leads to make sure that um, they're getting the right information mm -hmm. along the way mm -hmm. um, is in, is important as well. Absolutely. Well, well, thank you guys. I appreciate that. And you know, and getting into something that I know that you guys definitely know a lot about because this is primarily what uh, Winmark Franchise Partners uh, is aiming to do is to really help people get that process down correctly. And I think that one thing that everybody always asks you, I'm sure, is about you know that franchisee franchisor relationship. And I know that that's a very difficult thing to define and to get correct. But is there anything that you guys I uh, have in terms of you know trade secrets so to speak that have that are really helpful for people to know and is there anything specifically like you know a tool that people put in place like a committee that you guys have seen that have worked really well not only within Winmark but your other clients you guys have worked with too yeah I think one of the things we stress uh, that's really important is to just make sure you define what the franchise relationship is from day one uh, and that means from the moment you start talking to them through your discovery day is make sure that your franchisees understand what it is they're getting into. I think a lot of times people, there's a real mis 
misconception about what franchising is and what it's not. Uh, and it's important for both sides to have the right level set on expectations in terms of what does the franchisor do for that royalty and what does they, the franchisor expect of the franchisee mm -hmm. in representing their brand in that market. Uh, if you can define that up front and you both have a good understanding, you're going to start off on the much better foot. And from there, making sure that you reinforce that relationship at every turn. I think it's really important today, more so than ever, that you're transparent with your franchisees. Uh, we utilize and we recommend to our clients is to utilize the franchisees in either committees like an FAC, mm -hmm. Franchise Advisory Committee, uh, or even in specialized committees. If you've got work to do on a point of sale system or work to do on a CRM system is include some of your franchisees where they either have a level of expertise or interest in that area and make sure you get their feedback, but also make sure that they understand at the end of the day as a franchisor, you're going to take and gather that feedback, but you've got to make that call as to what's best for the brand, what's best for the system. So they may not always, while they give input, you may not always agree with that input. Uh, you're going to take that input in, but ultimately you're going to have to do what you think is you know, the greater good for the whole and not just for indi individual franchisees. Absolutely. Great. Alan, anything, anything to add? Yeah, I, I think, you know, obviously communication is key mm -hmm. and keeping that open line of c communication is, is valuable mm -hmm. as you start talking about the franchise or franchisee relationship. Um, that's where, as we talked uh, a few minutes ago about the franchise operations individual, bringing them on board is important as they can be your direct line to the franchisees to figure out if there's anything that is an issue with them, if they have any concerns, um, and kind of head that off before it actually becomes an issue. And that franchise operations person can bring it back to the franchise or to, to remedy the situation. But that open line of communication is extremely important. 100%, and, and thank you guys for going through that. And you know, one thing that I'm always consistently curious about is I'm sure that you guys received this question a lot too. You know, Winmark's been around for a long time, obviously. And you know, Alan, I know that both of you guys have worked in organizations that have a really awesome culture. And I guess what I'm curious about uh, is when you're having conversations with these franchisees, with, the, with these franchisors and trying to help them through, you know, that operational process, I'm sure the culture comes up a lot. Uh, is there, you know, any recommendations you guys have in terms of, you know, what the right corporate culture really looks like? And, uh, or maybe it's more about, you know, you guys are helping them to try and figure out what is, what is the best way to ensure that everybody across the organization feels that culture? Is there any advice you guys have there for that? Yeah, I think um, there, there's, couple different aspects of culture. There's the brand culture that is unique to every brand and the personality of that brand and the, and the founders and kind of what their value system is and what their beliefs are. Uh, and that really has got to be true to them, mm -hmm. right? That's got to be true to the brand and who they are and what they're about. I think the franchisee, franchisor, that relationship culture, though, can uh, be the same for most everybody. And, and really, that comes down to uh, what are your beliefs, you know, and, and why do you exist as a franchisor? And at Winmark, we believe we exist because our franchisees are out there representing our brands, doing a great job, and sending in that royalty check. Without that royalty, we can't pay the people here, we can't provide the support, we can't do the things we need to do. So uh, understanding that they are not our customer, but they are our partner. And understanding that role and that responsibility and making sure that as the franchisor, uh, that you know that you exist because they exist. So the only thing then that really is important to you is that you can help them derive a, a good profit and a decent return on that investment they made when they put their faith in you and put their life savings on the line. And you know, one of the things we tell people here uh, internally is, hey, on Discovery Day, this isn't our money. You know, this is their money. We're the financial stewards of that investment. So just like anybody else out there that's taking money from someone on investment, our responsibility is to make sure that they get a good, healthy return on that investment. So that means we need to do whatever we have to do to help them to be successful. And that's going to be different with every franchisee. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you have that mentality and not just the 95, you know, 9 to 5 mentality, that you can say, well, that's just that franchisee. They're just being a pain. Uh, you know, you have to have the mentality of, we're going to do whatever we have to. Everyone's got a different personality. Everyone's got a different approach. But if they know that we will do everything we can to help them be successful, then they know that that's the kind of culture they want to buy into. Sure. Absolutely. Alan, Alan anything to add there? Yeah. Culture uh, should, should be set up right from the get-go as well. So right during Discovery Day, there should be a, 
a section on the culture and making sure that these potential franchisees buy into the culture. So knowing exactly what they're getting into, the culture of the of the brand. You know, Winmark Franchise Partners, we have a, a uh, product that we go through to help these emerging franchisors, help them with the culture and developing that and setting it up right during Discovery Day so they know exactly what these uh, the potential franchisees are getting into mm -hmm. is is very important. So um, making sure that that they know, you know, from an operational standpoint, from a marketing standpoint, from a brand standpoint, through every department, what that culture is and how it filters down from the top level all the way down to the to the customer level. Sure. Yeah, I think one of the things that we we've been able to add for our clients is. Um, we came from a very broken culture when we came into this company. You know, I was, I've been here now 18, going on 19 years. Uh, when you have a broken culture with your franchisees, you don't have trust, you don't have a relationship. It's very hard to get it back. And the only way you get it back is, you know, we started just saying, hey, here's the two or three things we're going to deliver every year. And then we try to deliver four or five things. Building up that trust mm -hmm. and getting them to believe in you and believe in the system again is critical. So when we talk to emerging brands who maybe don't have that culture or have a broken culture, um, they can appreciate where we're coming from because we're not just this big billion dollar public company. We're actually a company that came from almost bankruptcy to where we are today over the last 18 years. And we did it by building on these fundamental blocks that we have in place that we utilize with Winmark Franchise Partners. Awesome. Great. So in closing, guys, I um, wanted to just to ask you because you guys have seen a lot in, in, in franchising. I mean, a lot of, you know, a lot of my favorite conversations when I was growing up in the franchise space was walking the IFE floor and, you know, getting to talk to getting to talk to you guys and all that good stuff. And so would love to kind of hear, you know, looking back when you guys really first got started uh, in in franchising, just in general, I'm sure there were a lot of things that you wish you could have done a little differently. Is there any anything that you should that you could say that you know may help people to look out for anything of that nature? I know not just one because I know that we don't have time for them all because there's obviously a lot. But is there anything in particular that comes to mind? Yeah, I would say the one thing I think that uh, we encourage all of our clients to do is there's there's networks out there, there's events out there. One of them coming up in a couple months, Springboard, mm -hmm. uh, which we meet a lot of clients at as well. We've met a couple of our clients at Springboard, matter mm -hmm. of fact. Uh, and we participate every year on different panels, but get out to these events. You know, I think the hardest part as an emerging brand is you tend to be on an island and you don't think anyone else is going through the things that you're going through. And when you get to these events, you realize there's a whole host of people. There's hundreds of people. There's 300 new franchisors every single year that are going through the very same things that these guys are going through. Not only do you get that network of, of your peers that you can now rely on and call you know, late at night when you're uh, maybe at the, at the edge of the cliff in franchising and you need somebody to talk you off it, but you also re you know, meet all of the people that are either in legal or in PR or in marketing. Uh, but all of these people that are part of the network that and vendors and suppliers that you don't realize are there that can help you get to where you want to be so much faster if you just let them know you're looking for help. Absolutely. Yeah, in addition to the conferences, you know, Springboard's a great one. I've been there four or five times now out of, I think this is going to be the seventh one, yeah. if I remember correctly. You know, I've been there many, many times over my 25 plus years in, in franchising. And, you know, just that networking aspect, but also just the individuals who are willing to provide you information is is extremely extremely helpful asking them questions you know the ifa uh, it has some great events as well and people are so willing to share whether it's positive ex experiences negative experiences they're willing to help you out and you know we talked to a number of actually we were just talking about one of our competitors that um we've talked to a number of times you know and Franchisors are willing to do that. You mm -hmm. know, there, there's probably not another industry that people are willing to talk to their competitors, talk to others, give them advice to help them out to improve the segment, to improve the industry. Um, so just making sure, you know, if you, if you can't make it out to the conferences, pick up the phone and just call somebody. Chances are you're going to be able to um, connect with somebody um, and network with them to get, gain some great experience and some knowledge. 
Absolutely. Well, gentlemen, this was really awesome, and I'm really happy that we had a chance to do this, and thank you so much for letting us into the office, and uh, I hope that people will be able to learn from this because I think this was a really awesome segment. So thanks again, and uh, see you guys in a month. Perfect. Right. Thanks, Zach. Thanks, Zach. Cheers.